Is this a sub-series in the making? Very maybe. Live action anime productions. And what better way to potentially get started on this reoccurring gold mine than by starting off with one of the most influentially large anime shows of all time, Attack on Titan. Show's so big, I don't think it needs an introduction. And of course, with a project being so popular, it's no wonder the movie industry tried to take a stab at it too. Now, as a disclaimer for anyone concerned, I'm not going to be divulging into spoilers of late game Attack on Titan stuff. Actually, at the time of recording this, I haven't seen it. I'll be binging it as this is made. Instead, we are talking exclusively up to the timeline of the movies, which covers approximately half of season one, and that's it. There are a couple elements from later on, and I guess technically from season two too, but these these films came out in 2015, so that season hadn't even been adapted to anime form yet. And yes, I did just say films. This isn't a simple 90 minute ride, this project was a two-parter. Did I seriously watch three hours of this and all of out in the name of research? Yes. Yes I am. So with so much to cover, let's get into things. We begin in the wonderful lands of Shiganshi- Morzen? Okay, where we meet our trio protagonists standing on a bomb? Yeah, alright, so should probably explain now that this film adaptation takes a handful of artistic liberties with the IP to change the story. For a start, while the anime is set in a country inspired by Germany, what with the Germanic names like Arwin, Voermann, and Levi, in this world, it's within a Japanese setting. Sure. And as for the characters themselves, Armin is all into tinkering to show off his intellect, Mikasa is a dainty girl rather than the real muscle of the group, and Eren's desire is not to change the world, but to go beyond the walls. They say the ocean is out there. The boy can certainly shout, but act? <laughs> It's a little dicey. And when witnessing the wall, he claims to not even believe in Titans. Also, his and Mikasa's relationship is no longer adopted siblings and just a one-sided romantic obsession. But hey, at least they got the scarf bit transferring over, I guess. And then... And that is awesome. I get that it's mostly just a smoke simulation, but this IRL version of the Colossal Titan is just an amazing spectacle, you've got to admit. But here's where things really diverge. As the Titans begin to pour in, everything falls into chaos. But while in the anime, the big emotional focus point has Eren's mother trapped in her home and eaten as they escape, in this rendition, there is no mother. No hint of Eren's family at all. Instead, the emotional beat has Eren and Mikasa separated all until... They kill Mikasa. And I can kind of get what they were going for with an overcrowded building and not allowing anyone in, which is also an exclusive thing, but it's also played with just music as audio. No emotional screen crying, no regrets on character relationships, and no build up with a mouthly chomp. Maybe this film's biggest flaw is the fact that it's literally going up against one of the greatest opening executions of its industry. I can respect trying something new, but everything will fall in comparison to the original. My god. And then it tries to follow it up with Eren being the sole survivor of said building. How would they have even done that? Uh, Fast forward two years and Eren has finished his training, and here's where you're to notice all the changes. Everyone's immediately in the scouts regiment, no need for the arc of picking your role, and half the characters are scrapped from the original, whilst half are entirely new. Take our super leader director Kubal, being the combination of essentially all authoritative characters. Fair enough, gotta condense it into mere hours somehow. Then they introduce Hans the weapons chief and scout leader who is from the anime as Hanji, where she's mostly the same but isn't scout leader too. Another character slot taken. And while in the anime she appeared in the latter half of season one, now she's brought on earlier. As for another certain character mixed up in her escapades, he does not exist in this movie. There's no fan favorite character Levi. Why? Oh, because apparently his name cannot work well written in Japanese, and it's hard to pronounce for Japanese speakers. That is legitimately why he was skipped, from a show that's already produced in Japan. Okay. As for the fellow soldiers, they're all established in an 
interesting way. We see each of them saying their final goodbyes to their families, though there's more screen time on the families and no one mentions the soldiers by name, so actually learning these characters is nigh impossible, so I guess I'll explain them later. And while the anime does have a plot point of blockading a whole breach in the wall, simple changes made are instead of it being a second inner wall, it's now the main outer one, and instead of a giant boulder to save the day, the plan is to blow up above the wall and to have the debris clog the hole instead. Not bad. It's a simple way to resolve the beginning incident early. A couple soldiers do return as their two iconic, the potato obsessed Sasha for a hint of strangely timed comic relief, hothead Jean to argue with Eren again, and no one else. Not even the actually real out character Daz. Man, why did he have to get the Daz name? And you know, I really wish an anime adaptation would go balls to the wall more with hair colours, cause man, having everyone be dark haired really doesn't help with such an ensemble cast. Plus, it's just kinda boring. It's just so dry to watch. Is it because there's no music in any of this? In the anime, there's blaring climaxes and a fantastic soundtrack even for the quiet stuff. Here, it's an elongated stage music piece, followed by a whole lot of nothing. And off they go. Another thing to note, there's vehicles now. While the anime has a fantasy setting with wagons and horseback, here it's tanks instead. Jarring. Which is funny because there's a whole tactical explanation in season one about a formation of horses used to avoid titans sighted over a large distance as opposed to running and praying, but forget about it. Instead, they're going under the cover of night as titans are less active then. At least that's true. Then, after direct orders to get to location before sunrise, they randomly stop midway and whip out their lights to see. Geniuses, the lot of them. And after a brief romance between Sasha and Armin, this new girl trails away after hearing a child in the distance. It would be good if maybe we could hear it too, but we don't for a long while. And what do they discover but a baby titan? That's new. Let's not ask about how that works. Instead, everyone makes the worst next move and screams, despite titans being sensitive to human voices and with nothing achieved, they run as the sun starts to come up. You know a really poignant difference that makes this film feel odd? I think it's the colour palette. Whenever I think of the anime series, I see this particular tone of orange as the towns are perpetually in a sort of twilight. The direction really likes presenting scenes at sunset, whereas here it's just got that generic desaturated blue hue that just makes it look cheap or at the very least, less pretty. I guess it hides the VFX, but man, does it not do it any favors. And then there's this guy. Sanagi, who I kid you not, just grabs a titan and throws him over his shoulder. What is this? And the group are saved by our final new characters, Captain Shikishima, our replacement slot for Levi, and Mikasa. She wasn't dead after all, somehow. And she radically avoids Eren too. Her whole motivation of protecting Eren as a promise to his mother, poof. And Eren's revenge arc on the Titans for killing Mikasa is, uh, but hey, at least now Mikasa's not presented as a dainty damsel in distress anymore. Uh. And instead of bombarding you with all of my links this time, I'm going to promote just one thing today. Check out this playlist linked in the cards or in the comments. It's a playlist from our Clips channel. It's not a long watch, but it's a new channel I'm working on on the side. Trying new avenues. I'd appreciate the support. And of course, if you haven't already, do subscribe to help us out and reach the end of this vid for a hint on what's next. For the next 15 minutes, everyone rests, which is good. As much as we are narrowing plot points, having a pause is good for pacing. The military leader accesses hidden bombs, Eren and Jean fight for real this time, Time, Shikishima monologues to Eren about who the real enemy is, Armin and Sasha connect again, and the others talk of Eren and Mikasa, including this guy, Soda, who's a replacement for Hanez as the protective type from the before times, now being a drunken mess rather than a garrison captain. Also Mikasa and Eren briefly speak, Mikasa now has a bite on her hip, Shikishima has a weird possession over Mikasa for some reason, Eren freaks out, and then this lady appears, Hiana, who dotes over Eren to be the father to her child. Child. Some interesting digressions, though seemingly pointless too. Hiana's not established well and the bite doesn't explain how Mikasa survived, but you just gotta go with it. And then Hiana dies. And now we see the ODM gear in action. Finally! Why hasn't anyone up to this point done it? And the execution ain't bad. 
It's choppy in places, but it does the job. Sanagi, for some reason, attacks with an axe to the ankle, and it consistently works in this canon. And hey, here's a direct adaptation. There's a couple that's been established in the ranks, and one's giving the other CPR. The twist, of course, being he's ripped beyond repair. The anime is a bit more subtle with its censorship, and so knowing YouTube, you'll just have to imagine how the live action one looks. Still, the moment is great. Thumbs up from me. And then she goes on a revenge rampage, stopping a saboteur from destroying the explosive they need and blows up a titan instead. And then, after a brief team rescue of Jean on a rooftop, the final major adaptation comes in. Eren is relieved of his leg, he witnesses Armin about to be eaten, and though this time everyone's here to help, nothing works. Eren somehow dives up into his mouth and takes his place. Not motivated by Armin's desire as a kid or anything, we've not got the time, so again, some emotional weight is lost. And the deed has him losing his arm as well. And you probably know what follows next. Only now does Mikasa seem to actually care. And instead of a surprise appearance from behind, here's Eren's Titan form up front and center. I like the display. And though it is expected to be a surprise, the anime is a bit stronger on the hint, since this film only plays a single shot and moves on. Still now, he destroys every Titan in sight and soon's run out of steam. Somehow they instantly know he's inside the nape and that ends it there. Only now do we get a real inkling of Eren's Titan explanation, as a flashback to his until now non-existent dad injecting him with something before being taken away by the higher ups. And that's all you get. Time for interrogation time. Everyone's of course freaked out over Eren's Titan form, and while in the anime it's another officer entirely, Voerman, doing the deed in a much more paranoid way, this time it's our conglomerate role general director Kubal. People come to defend Eren's case, it's a tad less dramatic than the anime version, but he's not having any of it. Even shooting old man Soda, which is certainly not what happens to Harness in the anime timeline. Still, the divergences certainly keep you on your toes. And before Eren is executed, a new titan burst through to save him. And all of that took up the first 20 minutes of the second film. They really dug their teeth into this scene. It's almost anime length. Okay, so with a new plan in place to grab the bomb from the first scene, so that's why it's here. The rest of the crew make preparations, whilst Jean is still belittling them all despite clearly having enough experience for a character arc. But no, we never even reach the more gripping part of him feeling guilt and pressure as a leader of the group. He just remains a minor rival. Shame. As for Eren, it's all new from here. He's taken to a mysterious white room with archaic items and monologued by Shikishima about the origins of Titans, and how apparently it was a science experiment on humans that went berserk everywhere, even showing footage of Earth as we know it. Not quite as the anime perceives it, I think. And while up to this point I've praised the visual effects, this scene here kinda loses me. Green screening the crew onto a wagon as it travels just gives this amateur looking effect that really wasn't necessary, especially considering it's just countryside around them. Anyway, as Shikishima continues, he states how convenient the breach was for the government as it quelled all discontent as it redirected hatred towards titans instead, and how he's leading a rebellion for a non-authoritarian world, where they have assault rifles and RPGs. Alrighty then. But the crew collect the dud bomb and the two teams mash, now with Captain Shikishima stating that he will destroy the inner wall to lead Titans in to topple the regime and lead an uprising. Dun dun dun. Everyone disagrees, Shikishima beats Eren and Mikasa too, and after a brief bomb threat, the battle is won by... Uh, Sanagi grappling a nearby tower and literally pulling it over through brute strength alone. All the while he's getting shot up, but he still keeps going. This is just ridiculous. Yeah, okay, sure. This new character is like a god, it's ridiculous. How did he throw a titan earlier? It just seems like the stupid way to progress forwards. And the grieving for him after the fact is lackluster at best. With a plot surrounding so much death, you've really gotta nail the emotional beats of it, otherwise it just becomes stale. Still, we're in the final 30 minutes now. This film was all the exposition bits. Shikishima reveals himself to be the titan from before. Surprising no one. And the transformation for him is legitimately epic. I hope I can show it. His face isn't as impressive. And with all the stakes here, we're back to the outer wall. Ready for Shikishima to destroy some more titans, despite them being a great aid to him if he thought about it. 
and the crew all team up to try to take him down without the Aaron Trump card. As you can probably guess, it doesn't work out, so it's time for another episode of Power Rangers, I guess. To be fair, this does come up later in the anime, but considering this is already in the Tokotatsu style, it just feels like more of the same. The choreography is mostly punches rather than some MMA fight, but Eren does use a helicopter blade from something faintly established at the start. And with a final callback to the Jean fight earlier, Eren takes him down. Final thing left is to explode the wall, except Eren passes out and Mikasa has to talk to him through the nape, something that is actually adapted from the series, and then the director general pops up. Mr government himself because it turns out in the movie canon at least he is in fact the colossal titan himself admittedly I wasn't expecting this. I never reached even the scouting part of the anime series when I watched it years ago, so the idea that the Colossal Titan was someone was something my brain never even went to. Perhaps it's a bit easy and cliche to just say government bad, and they do play it a bit on the nose. <laughs> But to wrap up a story in three hours, it makes great sense to loop us back to the beginning somehow. And it is hinted at as we see the director waddling past Armin in the first minutes of the film, getting into position. Actually, overall, I think I would say that this adaptation actually does a lot of things right. As much as super fans hated many of the changes that were made, Apparently, they were suggested by out creator himself, Hajime Isayama. And there were a good chunk of faithful adaptations. Sasha's bow, the theme of cow and cattle, the slashing of ankles to a certain extent, and a comment on wanting a sexy titan, as well as the stuff mentioned before. Sometimes it's some weird choices, but you gotta get what you can get, I guess. Yet, at the same time, there are just so many advantages to animation that this film couldn't possibly replicate. Like, look at everyone flinging about. It delivers, but what's missing are those close-up character moments to show more than action, but thought too. Similarly, there are shots that are impossible to do in real life that really execute fantastically in animation, or things that are possible in reality are rare in the film, and replicated in the anime instead. And while the concept is quite the bloodfest, when comparing approaches, the anime is surprisingly tame. And actually, having a slow-mo particle effect almost hits home harder than potato masher. And the extended runtime allows for far more emotional beats, whilst the movie seems to avoid it at every turn. And while this final fight is good, it feels weird. It really does take you back to the standard japanese style. A lot of the issues this movie comes up with other than some poor choices is the fact that just translating anime elements into live action is just weird. Hans comes off as cringy and over the top where it's much more fitting in the animation, even with everyone acting like it's an amateur theatre play. The anime also gets to slow down its pacing and jump to flashbacks which adds something over the chronological approach of the movie. The literal first scenes of each really highlight which one grips you the most, you know? That being said, the movie's making a great effort. I mean, hey, this final fight isn't just a head-on clash. Both parties are also manipulating the bomb for their goals. Somehow they made a bag for a titan. That's quite impressive, I have to say. Not where I expected it to go. And it's not without sacrifice either, as completely off from the anime now, Jean is soon swept away by Colossus. They use RPGs to help, the bomb doesn't go off, Shikishima shows up too, he tightens up, grabs the bomb, and slam dunks to victory. One explosion follows another, and the wall debris clogs itself. What a ridiculous way to end it. Maybe it's cheap, maybe it loses the sanctity of my attack on Titan, but it gets the job done on higher stakes. You get your big money shot of Mikasa saving Eren, no one really gets a final word in, and Mikasa and Eren witness beyond the wall is all ocean. Kinda makes you wonder how the Titans got here and how they weren't wet, but oh well. I can't believe I spent £7 for both movies only to discover I can watch them on Funimation for free. What an experience. The movie does so many things right as best they can, but also so many things wrong by their own fault or not. The colossal visuals are stellar at times, but while Armin comes off as the best execution of their character, there's still something to be desired with the lack of a weakness arc and a simple romance plot instead. Really, this comes off as a great case study of the trials of anime adaptations. The biggest flaw of the movie is the fact that it's going up against THE Attack on Titan. I mean, with a source material that supermassive, 
this itty bitty project just had no chance. Now I'm even more paranoid for all the other anime adaptations coming our way. For now though, I'd best get out myself. My name's been Daz, you didn't really care. Next time we've got an adaptation video mentioned many times before on the channel, and I'll see you in a bit. Oh. <sighs>